Welcome to IT Pro TV, your source for online IT training. Whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned IT pro, we've got courses to meet your needs. CompTIA, Cisco, Linux, Apple, Microsoft, security, cloud, and more. All online, all on demand. Check out our binge-worthy IT training at itpro.tv. Hello, and thanks for joining us today for this IT Pro TV webinar. Have a question? Use the Go to Webinar question box throughout the webinar, and we will answer as many as we can at the end. You will receive a link to the recording of the webinar delivered to your inbox. Now let's get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to IT Pro TV, brought to you by ACI Learning. I'm Wes Bryan, joined by... Don Pazet. Yeah, welcome to How to Get Into IT. That's right. You know, if you're just getting started into IT, this webinar is going to be for you because we're going to be ch uh, taking your questions live starting about, well, how about right now? Uh, so make <laughs> sure that you put those questions in the chat. And one lucky viewer, you're going to get a chance to win some of this wonderful IT swag. So we definitely want to see some of your questions because your questions are important to you. Uh, or to you. How about to us as well? And Don's here to uh, help answer those. Uh, so Don, you know, uh, while we have our viewers out there and they're trying to get some of those questions in that we can answer, you have a very interesting story in how you got started into IT. And I think it's something that some people can relate to. Can you tell sure. our viewers about it? Yeah, you know, getting into any new career field is difficult because you have a lot of questions, a lot of unknowns, and IT is a little bit more complex than most because it's such a big, it's a big term, right? What counts as IT? Well, a lot of things count as IT, so that means there's a lot of different ways to get in. So I, I thought I would start by sharing my story and how I got into IT, which was way back. This wasn't a long time ago. I've been in IT a long time. Uh, but after high school, I decided that I wanted to become an attorney. I, I wanted to go to law school. And so I went to college working on a political science degree, not even related to, to computers at the time, but computers were my hobby. It was something that I really enjoyed. I, I built computers. I loved messing around with different operating systems. I ran a bulletin board. This was, a long, again, a long time ago. Uh, but to pay for college, I started building and selling computers. You know, they, they called them white boxes, right? Where I'd buy a bunch of parts, put them together, and then kind of sell them off to other people uh, in the local community. And so that was how I was just paying for school at the time. And as I got closer and closer to graduation, I realized, you know, I really enjoy IT. I love working with computers. Why don't I do that instead? And so I, I ended up switching degrees to computer science right there at the end. But it didn't really matter because I was already working in IT. I took a job with the company doing warranty repair. And uh, Wes, I don't know, do you remember Packard Bell? I do, so absolutely. Packard Bell computers mm -hmm. uh, were not known for being reliable, and so they, they, they broke quite a bit, uh, and I did warranty repairs. Mm -hmm. On those, so I would you know travel around and, and fix those up, uh, and then uh, compact computers mm -hmm. and a couple of other brands that were popular at the time. That kind of kept me busy, and then I just started soaking up information like a sponge. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn about networking, so I bought a couple of network cards and started figuring out how networking functioned. And then I wanted to learn about servers, and so I I had been messing around with Linux for several years at that point, but not as a server, more of as a workstation. So focusing on that server side. Windows NT4 was was cutting edge back then. So I started experimenting around with it a bit. And that's what led to advancements in my career as I got more information. Now, back then, I didn't have training available to me like we do today. So today, you can skip a lot of the stuff that I did. If you want to go right into security, if you want to go right into working with servers and networking and skip the break, fix, help desk stuff, you, you, you could. But man, I... I really learned a lot of great skills in those early stages of my career that I still use today, right? I, mm -hmm. I think, Wes, you probably have an example. What's something you learned in your first year of IT that you still use today? Oh, treating it like a hobby. That was yeah. one of the, yeah, I mean, it didn't, couldn't learn it in a book. Treating it like a hobby because then it didn't really feel like work and I was excited to learn more and more and more. That, that was one of the first things. Yep. Mm -hmm. And... And it can be like that. Now, there, there, there can be bad days, right? <laughs> there can be days where the server is down, you've got 10 people breathing down your neck. But most of the time, working in IT is a bit of an adventure. So if you if you enjoy that challenge of figuring out new things, figuring out different ways to achieve the same goal, working with cutting edge technologies, that's where it's really fun. But it all does really start as a hobby. If you enjoy it, it's easy to get into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that, you know, when I got started, I got started because I wanted a career change. And I got, I got tired of making like pretty much not good money, minimum wage. And I decided, hey, you know what? 
I'm going to go do something that I think I'm going to enjoy. And I tell you what, within the first few months of studying, I learned that I really, really did like IT. And the other thing that I had a passion for is just that lifelong learning, learning something new. It always became fun and always seemed challenging. And it's really nice to be able to overcome some, some of those challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have some questions that are coming in. You want to go ahead and say yeah, we uh, take a question? This one's, in. Sure. So this one's coming in from Dan L. Uh, and he asks, is it worth the time and effort to pursue a, an, an IT career, even if you're in your 50s? Uh, I'm changing careers, but do have three years experience. But it's been more than five or 10 years ago. So he's asking, is it worth it? Uh, you know, so it, it, like any question, it kind of depends. I, I would mm -hmm. say yes, and there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one is, and I, I'll use some generalizations here, but in, in, in my experience, when you have people who are in their 50s or you know past really past their 30s, generally have a better work ethic. And I don't know mm -hmm. if that's just because of how society has changed or whatever, but more of a willingness to dedicate themselves to focus, to study, to learn new technologies. And, and that really shows up in the work that they do. So it's certainly not a, a negative, like a detractor, in, in my opinion. Now, you will hear about people that, that talk about age discrimination and how sometimes it can be challenging to get into the, the IT career field if you, you know, are in the, the latter stages of your career. But that usually stems from lack of experience, right? So if you don't have any IT experience whatsoever on your resume, then it's actually going to be challenging to get in regardless of what your age happens to be. So what you need to do is look back at your career as you've, as you've done it, and, and I don't know your background necessarily, but see, are there aspects of what you did that would apply to what you do in IT? And I'll give you a great example, which is project management, mm -hmm. right? Let's say you worked in construction. You were a drywaller, right? Well, you worked projects. There were projects you had, there was a budget, there was a schedule that had to be followed. You know, maybe you were a project manager for that, not in IT, but for construction. Well, it's the same skill to manage IT projects. So you have to find ways to leverage those skills you've already got and then fill the gaps in with what you're missing. So you want to prove that you can function in IT. So you're going to need to get some certifications or potentially a degree. Sometimes you can get by with like, you know, on LinkedIn, you can get recommendations from people where they could say, oh, I, I know this person and they really know storage appliances. But it's not a guarantee and that's not as good as having a certification or a degree. So you'll want to get some education under your belt. All right, Dan, thank you very much for that question. Another one, Don, coming in from William said, I've only worked in custom, the customer service field. I have a bachelor's degree in kinesiology, and I'm interested into going into cybersecurity or the networking IT field, but I really don't know where to get started. All right. Well, we're going to get started by Googling what kinesiology is. <laughs> Holy moly. Uh, the scientific study of human body movement. That sounds awesome. All right. So, so I don't know how we can apply that necessarily to technology, right? But, <laughs> but, but let's just kind of boil this down to the, the basics. You have a degree and a degree in any topic is useful for proving two things, right? So uh, one, it's that you're willing to learn things you don't necessarily want to, right? Because when you do a degree, there's always some gen ed requirements that people just hate, but you've done it. Uh, so that, that's one thing. Uh, but then the second thing is you've proven that you can, can learn and that usually equates to being a good leader. A degree is typically a requirement of any kind of management. So if you're interested in getting into cybersecurity, there's different parts or, or job roles inside of cybersecurity. So there's what we see on TV, the pen testers, right? The Mr. Robots that are hacking in. That type of job you can't get without experience. You've got to have experience in cybersecurity before you can become a pen tester. Nobody, uh, you'd be a fool to hire somebody as a pen tester with zero experience. Like that's just not responsible. Uh, however, every cybersecurity event uh, or every uh, engagement, they call them engagements, when like, let's say, let's say Wes and I go out and hire a cybersecurity company to come and pen test our organization, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a number of people involved. There's going to be a project manager because it, it is a project. There's going to be somebody who's tracking compliance, documenting findings, right? And this is something that, that's a little bit more entry level. Like you could get your start just as somebody doing the documentation for a cybersecurity engagement. Uh, there are many places that will bring people on as a, like an apprentice or a, uh, I wanna say like a, like an intern? Kind of like an intern, mm, yeah. Sure. Like an intern or apprentice where you're watching the pen testers do their work and you're doing the documentation for it. That means you can be entry level and you're not 
putting anybody at risk. Like you're not trying to pen test a Fortune 500 network that instead it's the pen tester that's doing it, but you gain the benefit of experience mm -hmm. and building your resume and then get to move up to that position. Uh, then there's there's also just like the, the, the financial arm. You, you have to bill for things and so on, which is not really IT, but it's all a part of what a cybersecurity company does. Those are some ways to get into it, but also don't forget about most security professionals start on the blue team side, not the red team side, right? So red team is attacking and that's gonna be your pen testers. But blue team, that's really any kind of information security officer, sys admin, database admin, your, your network admins, all of those other areas, they're all having to defend their networks. And defending a network is a great way to learn the offensive capabilities. You know, if, if you know how to defend it, you obviously have to know how the attack works. And so you can build up experience that way. Don't hesitate to take a job in like sysadmin or network admin, even though you want to get into cybersecurity, that experience will help you get into cybersecurity eventually. All right, thank you for that question there, William. This one's coming out from YouTube, Don. It says, uh, would you recommend taking an A plus, uh, CompTIA A plus, uh, before getting into IT, or is it best to start slow and start with a fundamental certification? Uh, you know, this one, I, I, I'm not going to answer too many questions with it depends, but this one <laughs> sort of, it depends on what your goal is, right? right? Sure. So if you already know what type of, of career, like, like with that last question, uh, the I've already forgotten the name, but uh, <laughs> William. Yeah. William. So yeah. William knew he wanted to get into cybersecurity. Okay, so for him, it, it doesn't make sense to do IT fundamentals, right? IT fundamentals it covers several different areas of IT, and it's phenomenal for people who don't know what they want to do because you learn a little bit about what network admins do. You learn what sysadmins do. You learn what cybersecurity specialists do. You learn what database administrators do. Even development, right? I, I think there's six different job roles that are all wrapped into IT Fundamentals Plus. So if you don't know what you wanna do in, in technology, or you're not familiar with each of those or the differences, IT Fundamentals is great, right? It's going to help you to, to get a better idea of what type of job you want in IT. If you already know though, if you say, I wanna be a network admin, then it's pretty safe to skip over IT fundamentals and move right into things that are a little more focused onto that area. Now, I do encourage people to get a broad base of knowledge, and A-plus is phenomenal mm -hmm. for that. A-plus covers a lot of sysadmin, network admin skills, and a little bit of security, right? So it, it's kind of like a light version of Network Plus, Security Plus, and... Uh, what did I leave out? I well, know, a, a plus would be part of that, okay. the hardware. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So, so you get a bit of that. Now, I mean, if you really knew, like, I want to be a Cisco network technician, then you might choose to skip IT fundamentals and A plus, go right mm -hmm. into network plus, go right into CCNA. You can do that. But you're putting yourself at a bit of a, uh, like you're stepping off on the wrong foot because you're going to get a lot of high level information real, real fast. Mm -hmm. And so the learning curve is going to be steeper. It's going to be a little more challenging to do that. So if you're not being rushed, if you've got tons of time on your hands, it certainly doesn't hurt to do IT fundamentals and then A-plus and kind of move through them in order. But if you're in a hurry, like if you need a job in three months and you know that's how fast you're trying to move, then you might benefit from stepping up to some of the, the more advanced certs. All right, thank you for that question out there. Brian's got one, Don, here, and I almost think I can answer this one quick, but uh, we're gonna throw this one at you. What's the best operating uh, server system, so I would say operating system for servers, uh, to learn the most, or should they be learned equally? You know, it's not it's not all equal right now. Right. So, so I'll define a, a line on this one. Now, if you're doing work with small businesses, in small business environments, Microsoft Windows is still the dominant server that you'll find. If you go to your neighborhood dentist office, they probably have an Active Directory domain controller right there, right? Uh, a lot of your, your smaller and, and some medium, uh, a lot of school boards, they still use Windows Server pretty, pretty predominantly, right? But once you get outside of that, when you take a look at like the Fortune 500, the, you know, the big companies of the world, the companies that have moved online, your subscription businesses, businesses that run on web apps that use containers and so on, it's almost entirely Linux at the server level. And you know, Microsoft has even put out numbers for this. If you look at Microsoft Azure last year, so I, I don't have this year's numbers, but in 2021, over 60% of the virtual machines that were spun up on Azure were Linux machines. And that's on Microsoft's own platform. You go over to AWS, it's not even close 
the bulk of, of virtual machines or instances spun up on AWS are Linux based. So when it comes to server operating systems, the big guys, the, the, the larger companies and the future companies, they're going to be Linux based. That's mm -hmm. the one you want to learn. But today in the small and medium market, it's Windows Server. So you just have to think about which type of job you're wanting to apply for, what opportunities are available to you. You know, if you're just getting started in IT, Facebook's probably not going to hire you. Google is probably not going to hire you. And they're all Linux, right? But the local computer repair shop probably would hire you. And they're likely going to be running Windows Server. So that, that's how we have to look at that. All right. Thank you very much for that question. Kyle's got one coming in here, and I'd like to chime in on this one. He says, I am taking uh, my A-plus core one tomorrow. Uh, any last-minute suggestions to deal with anxiety? And also, what are the uh, simulator questions like? Or are they multiple choice? Well, I can actually jump sure. in here yeah. on this one. Uh, one is to trust in yourself and your, your ability to study. It's going to be very, very hard to deal with some of that anxiety. But just, just believe Believe in yourself that you've done your studies, right? And ju uh, just try your best, get a bunch of sleep, drink a lot of water, make sure that you're fueled up going into the exam booth. When it comes to the exam, there are going to be performance-based questions that might actually uh, have you actually perform some kind of operation, but you're also going to get multiple choice and multiple answer as well. Where the great thing, though, is pay attention to the context of the question. A lot of times when it's more than one answer, they're going to tell you that. Uh, and another thing, make sure you answer every question, because if you say, I don't know, and you move on and you don't answer it, it's always wrong. At least give yourself the benefit of knowing, hey, you've studied and you're gonna do a good job. And on, on A+, plus, you can skip a question and come you back, You most right? definitely can, yes. If it's your first exam, I, I don't know if you've taken other cert certification exams mm -hmm. or not, but if you haven't, time management is a problem for a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. You've only got a certain amount of time to complete the exam, and so you don't want to run out of time and have questions you didn't even get to, mm -hmm. right? So if there's a question you're struggling with, if you're you know kind of stuck on one, you don't know the answer, just skip it. Skip it right away, don't waste time, right? Go all the way through all of the questions and then come back and hit the hard ones that you weren't sure on. And they've got where you can mark them so it's easy to come back to it. And then I'm going to give you some advice. And this, this might be bad advice, so I'm, I'm curious <laughs> about your opinion, Wes. But for me, I never study the night before an exam. Mm -hmm. And what I found was happening, because I used to, mm -hmm. was that whatever I studied the night before would be like really forefront in my mind. And it would make it harder for me to kind of retrieve some of the older information that I had learned. And I found by just taking a day off, and not studying the day before the exam, that actually helped me out a lot. Uh, so your uh, your results may vary, or your mileage <laughs> may vary, right? But, you know, it's Take it for what it is. It's advice. Yeah, I, I'm close to that. I, I don't say don't study anything the night before. I say just take one thing that you're not sure about and, and just read up on it a little bit. Don't go crazy. That might be one more question that helps you pass that exam. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, all right, thank you very much for that, Kyle. Uh, and the next question that we have coming up here, Don, uh, this is from Tristan. said, I finished the uh, Google IT professional cert, and I'm now studying for CompTIA's A+. Uh, I feel like the current job market is requiring more than just looking uh, – just to get looked at by employers, uh, where should I look for the actual opportunities? So let me make sure that I've said that right. I feel like the current job market is requiring a lot more uh, than to just get looked at by uh, employers. Where should I start looking for opportunities? All right, so, uh, you know, one challenge or one thing that, that certifications really help with is getting your resume noticed. And there are certain certifications like CompTIA A+, or Microsoft's MCSE, Cisco's CCNA, that hiring managers all around the world, they know those, right? HR departments are familiar with those. And so when they're looking for applicants, those stand out, that gets you noticed, and then you go into the interview process, right? But HR people are getting so many resumes these days, especially with like you know, the, the headhunters. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, there are... I forget what they're actually called. Could we just call them recruiters? headhunters? Recruiters. There yeah. we go. <laughs> so, recruiters are people that can help you find a job, right? Now, they get paid by when you get a job, they get a percentage of your first year salary is how it usually works, like a 10% of your first year salary. So they're going out there and trying to find a job for you because they'll make some money on it. Now, on a positive, that's going to expose you to more opportunities than you'd normally have because these recruiters, they do it for a living and they're financially motivated. Uh, on a negative side, there are some companies that won't hire from recruiters because they don't want to pay 10% extra, right? Uh, so that, you know they want to take it out of your salary, not bolt it on top of a salary. So, mm. so there, there's pros and cons. I've, I've actually used a recruiter in the past. Uh, I, I had a, a positive experience with a recruiter. Not, not everybody does. Uh, 
So it, it does just depend. But that is one way to do it. So recruiters help you by gaining access to additional job markets that you might not be aware of. There's job postings that might even be internal just to that recruiter. Uh, and it certainly doesn't hurt to sign up with more than one recruiter. You just have to be careful with whatever contracts you sign. So that's one way to get noticed. But another thing is HR departments, they will usually have like an online form where you can go and submit and, and so on. Uh, that's pretty impersonal. And so your resume just gets lumped in with other things. But if it's a job opportunity that is in your in your city, right? And I, I know with the pandemic and stuff, a lot of this isn't as popular as it used to be. But, but one thing that works really well is go there in person to deliver your resume. Take your resume in and say, I'd like to apply for this job. And is there anybody who could maybe talk to me about the job a little bit? And it'll give me a better description. You're not asking for an interview. You're just asking to talk about the job. And it gets you a chance to get your face known. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a mini no pressure interview. You you basically become familiar to that HR department. That helps out as well. And again, we'll, we'll up, open up more opportunities for you. Last thing, networking. And mm -hmm. I don't mean the kind of networking I enjoy, which is TCPIP. I mean the other kind of networking that I don't enjoy, which is talking to people. Uh, get out and talk to people. There are, there are various groups that are out there, like um, you can go on meetup.com and stuff, computing groups, uh, subreddits, and, and places like that where you can meet other people in the industry. And you'd be surprised how many people are hiring and you just never see the job posting. You, you talk to people and you find out that way. So these are all different ways that you can find opportunities in IT. All right, thank you for that question. Next one coming in from YouTube says, I have experience in electronics and mechanical repair with minimal IT knowledge. What's the best way to move solely into IT without having to take a step down in pay or a pay cut while maintaining my current salary? Uh, oh, I got a three-letter answer for this one. IoT. Okay. IoT, Internet of Things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you mess around with Raspberry Pis or anything like that, these these really skirt the line between what we traditionally consider IT and electronics and mechanical repair. You know, you'll see people where they build these uh, Raspberry Pi projects where they control the lights on the Christmas tree and all that. Well, a lot of that requires a good understanding of resistors, capacitors, understanding or being able to use a soldering iron. And, and that's a skill that a lot of people in IT don't have. Well, most IoT these days run Linux distros of some sort. And so it's a great way to bridge that gap because of your background. I wouldn't normally recommend this to other people. I wouldn't say, oh, you want to get into IT? Start with IoT. It's great. But because of your background, I think that it's a little bit different for you. And there are some IoT certifications that are out there that you can pursue. It kind of gives you a little structure to what you want to study. Or, I mean, you can just go completely off the rails. If you start to learn some of the IoT platforms that are out there and create a project of your own, right? Uh, and it, it could be something simple like, um, uh, oh shoot, what did Justin make? He he made it was a Raspberry Pi that would yes, monitor that for water. Would, yes, it was a water uh, water tra uh, water system for his vegetable garden, and it would detect moisture and knew how to automatically turn on the water pumps. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. so you've got like servos that are controlling yeah. the water flow and all yeah. that, which is is probably trivial for someone with your background, <laughs> uh, but. If you build a project like that and open source it, right, put it in a public GitHub repository, expose it out to the world, that becomes a portfolio for you. You can say, this is something that I'm capable of. Here's the schematics and the design and, and so on. It's a great way to bridge that. Now, if you don't want to do that, if, you just, if you're just looking to go completely different and say, you know what, I, I don't want to use my old knowledge. I, I want to do databases now. All right, well, that doesn't tie to electrical engineering. And, and so there's not really a good tie in there. So you're basically starting from scratch. So that's where I, I say try and take advantage of your previous experience whenever you can and build off of that. Because one, it'll it'll make the learning curve a little less steep. It'll make it easier for you. And two, it'll help you take advantage of all the work that you've put into your career and your mm -hmm. knowledge. You know, don't don't waste that. You you're an expert in your field. Leverage that and and see if you can create something hybrid. Most definitely. And I like the hands-on nature of the IT, uh, IoT as well. It's not just all software. So thank you for that question. And another one coming in here that says, I am learning Python and I'm planning to get my CCNA after. Is that a good path? Uh, it is. It's a weird path. Uh, most people, <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't say it's a weird path. Uh, CCNA it has like very little of the developer automation in it. Uh, it the Python will absolutely help you for that. But I usually hear people go the other way around. They, they do CCNA first and they learn routers and switches. And then they get to that part where Cisco talks about their software-defined networking, right? Uh, and how you can 
uh, program ports for a VLAN all through software. And, and then people say, wow, I want to do that. I need to learn Python so I can <laughs> start to do that. And when you go into the CCMP level, some of the higher level search with Cisco, that's where you really need to have it. So I, I shouldn't have called it weird. It's just kind of a, a, a different order. I will say that a basic knowledge of Python programming will benefit just about every IT career. If you're in cybersecurity, sysadmin, netadmin, like Python is just an awesome language to learn and you can do so much with it. I, I have automated things in my life using Python scripts that, you know, I, I'm not a developer. I don't, I don't need to write programs, but I've seen repetitive tasks that I performed and said, boy, I need to automate this and let me just write a Python script for it. I, I have a, on my desk in my office, I have a little stream deck, which is a, it's by Elgato. It's a bunch of buttons and you can put different icons on the buttons. But when you push the button, you can have it do just about anything. And I have basically each one of my buttons calls a Python script that does something. So that's not even related to my job necessarily, but I, but I leverage that. It's incredibly useful. So uh, it looks good on your resume. If you want to become a full-blown developer, CCNA might not be the best choice for what you're doing next. But if you're looking to get into like cloud deployments of Cisco infrastructure, you're doing great. CCNA is a good start. You'll need to go on to CCMP to really, really marry up that Python knowledge to what you can do in the Cisco world. All right. Thank you for that question. Here's one that's coming in, Don, and I know this one's near and dear to your heart. Uh, which Linux distro would you suggest for somebody completely new to Linux? All right. If you are completely new to Linux, uh, you, first, you need to accept the fact that you may hate Linux. It's possible. Not everybody loves it. It, it certainly has it, its uses. And... So you might try it for a little while and decide it's not for you and move on, right? So I don't want you to make a significant investment in Linux. You know, some people will go out and buy a dedicated Linux laptop and so on. Don't do that yet, right? The best thing you can do is start with something like Ubuntu. Ubuntu is very easy to install, supports a ton of hardware, can run in just about every virtualization product that's out there. So if, you, if you're running Windows, you can install VirtualBox, which is, is a free virtualization package from Oracle. You could use Microsoft's Hyper-V, which is included in like Windows Pro. Uh, you could use, uh, well, KVM. There's any number of different virtualization products that are out there. Uh, and you can install Ubuntu in there and get a test of Linux. Now, there are some people who say, well, don't use Ubuntu because it's going to give you a GUI and then you're not going to learn anything, right? If you really want to learn Linux, you'll go command line. You'd be hardcore, right? Well, in the Windows world, we now have the Windows subsystem for Linux. You don't even have to install a Linux distro. You can bring up WSL and it's Ubuntu by, by default. There's other distros that are supported too. It's Ubuntu that's in there. And so now you can start to learn the command line without the GUI attached. That kicks the training wheels off and kind of makes you get a little more involved in it. Uh, that's a great way to learn, I think, and very low investment, low risk. You know, you don't have to spend any money. If you like it and love it, you can continue to evolve. If you don't like it, you know, you can just remove the virtual machine and, and the problem solved and it goes away. So I like Ubuntu as a good starter OS. It's also got a lot of good documentation that's out there and a lot of software packages come packaged for Ubuntu. Now, that being said, once you get into the real world, once you move into production deployments, there's other distros that may be a little more suitable, right? Uh, for medium and uh, government work, you'll see Red Hat Enterprise Linux a lot, RHEL, which you can learn for free by using Alpine Linux or um, Alma. Alma. Mm -hmm. Yep, Alma Linux, uh, Rocky Linux. I, I said Alpine, Alpine's wrong. So Alma Linux and Rocky Linux mm -hmm. are the two big ones. Uh, actually, Oracle's Linux is based on Red Hat as well, So and, and those are all free. So you can learn it with those. Uh, there's Fedora and a few others that are great for just experimenting around on. But in the production world, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, Amazon's Linux. And Amazon Linux is, is a little bit strange. It's kind of based off of Red Hat as well. So uh, that would be a good one to learn for the real world business skill. But Ubuntu is a great starting point. And uh, honestly, I, I use Ubuntu for production server workloads as well. Lots of people do. Uh, when I say lots, I mean like millions of people do. So it, it's a very common thing. All right. Great question. A lot of good questions. This one I like, Don, because this is an interview question. You're supposed to say this one's a bad question. This, one, <laughs> <laughs> this one's bad. No, it's a, seriously, though, this is a good question. Interview question is the context. If they ask you if you don't know how to solve a problem, is uh, answering, I'll gonna, I'm going to Google it, uh, or maybe I'll ask for help. Is that a, is that a good answer on a, uh, you know, in an interview? So if I were the interviewer, that would be a great answer, okay. right? Because the reality is, if you're trying to solve a problem, you use every tool at your disposal. You don't say, 
um, I'm not going to use the internet. I'm going to solve this on my own. Uh, or you know, I'm going to, I'm going to dig up the documentation because the documentation likely sucks. I mean, <laughs> that's just how it is, right? So Google is a great resource and, and you could say specific sites like, well, I use Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow, um, the Spiceworks forum, so, something like that. That's fine too. But Google hits all of them and having, just having a, we call it Google Foo, right? Mm -hmm. You know, having a, a good skill of how to find the right information using Google, that's a technical skill. I, I think you should put that on your resume. Like, I'm really good at using Google to find the right answer. Because, you know, when you jump on Google, and, and this is where you might need to back it up, where they say, all right, you Google and you find a solution, how do you know you can trust it, right? Short answer is, you can't trust it. So you've got to test it before you push it into production. But if you go on Google and you find five different ways to solve a problem. How do you pick which one? How do you know which one is the right one, right? That's gonna be the part where you have to be able to back up your answer. So you could say, for example, uh, I based on reputation. I'm having a problem with Windows. I Googled, this result is from Microsoft. I can probably trust that, right? Or this one's from a third party forum, but it was answered by a guy who's a book author for Windows. All right, we can probably trust that one too. Um, but if you say, all right, I, I get down to like answer number four and it's Joe in Boise, Idaho, you know, you don't know who that is. You don't know if you can trust that answer. You don't know if you make the changes that they're recommending, whether or not it's going to weaken your security. I can't tell you how many times I see like something's not working in Windows and you Google how to fix it. And somebody says, well, step one, disable user account control. Step two, or user access control. Do I have that? User account on? control. I had it right. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, which, that's a pivotal security feature of Windows, and they're telling you just to d d disable it, right? I can't get to this website. Step one, disable your firewall. Are you kidding me? Like, that's not something you can trust. So, if you say, if I don't know how to solve it, I'm going to Google it, that's fine, but be ready for those follow-up questions of, here's how I know I'm not getting garbage advice from Google. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's another one. And I hear this one come up a lot. So I, I'm, I'd be interested in your response, Don. So um, we've got a question that says, any tips on getting past the imposter syndrome on a job? Don, they, he's specifically calling you out. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying you have it. <laughs> All right. So I, I do have a, an answer for this because I get asked about it a lot. And I, I'll tell you that I, I think that most people in IT have imposter syndrome to some degree. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is where people feel like they're not qualified enough to be in the job that they have. So like, let's say you're hired as a network admin and you might feel like, oh, I don't know Cisco equipment well enough or Juniper or whatever. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an imposter. And as soon as they find me out, I'm going to get fired, right? A lot of people feel like that. And the reason is, is nuanced. It's not usually because they're an imposter, right? Typically, the interview process filters out people who are imposters. If you can't answer a few basic questions, you don't get the job. And so that, that kind of takes care of it. But the reason so many people feel like they're imposters is because technology changes so fast, right? If you are a commercial drywall installer for a construction company, that has not really changed in 30 years, probably longer. I don't know. So if you learned how to do it 30 years ago, you're probably doing it the same way today, except you're really, really good at it because it hasn't changed. But in IT, things change fast. They change fast every couple of years. Something you learn today might be totally obsolete three years from now, right? So you're always learning, and that will sometimes make you feel like an imposter. Uh, just take like, like right now, containers and Kubernetes are the big buzzword. Well, maybe you, you haven't worked with those. So you've got to learn them and you're just trying to learn as best you can. And so you feel like an imposter. Well, two years from now, Kubernetes will be a joke and everybody will be running something else with a crazy name from Google or, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, and you're starting over again. So even if you became an expert at one, now you're, you're starting over. And that's just the nature of IT. So you just have to accept that. Uh, I know that's not the greatest, like, just suck it up. <laughs> but, but, but that is the reality of it is IT changes fast. And so that's why you feel like an imposter. It's hard to stay ahead. So you just do all that you can. Uh, you know, one of the things that I do is I'm constantly reading, constantly mm. monitoring the tech news and, and trying to stay ahead of things so that I don't get overwhelmed. Uh, if you take a couple of years off and say, you know, I'm just going to relax. I'm not going to worry about certs or anything. 
Well, it starts to pile up. And eventually, eventually you actually do become an imposter. You become a network admin that hasn't learned anything in five years and you're deploying new equipment and you don't know how to configure it, right? Well, yeah, you just became an imposter. So you've got to study, you've got to stay up to date even after you get your job. All right, thank you for that question. Here's another one coming in, Don said, and this is more of targeting like a management position. It says, how can I develop management skills while targeting an IT manager position? Uh, you know, so this one's a challenging one because uh, management skills, a big part of being a manager is working with people, you know, having direct reports, people that, that report to you. And how do you get that experience? Well, what I find usually works is when you're a part of a team, like a network team or a sysadmin team or whatever, there'll typically be a team lead, somebody who's leading that group. Now, if you have no management experience whatsoever, you might still be able to step into that kind of team lead position if your company does that, but not every company does. So another option, another way you can kind of dip your toe into it is project management. Project management is kind of like running a department on a smaller scale. You have a budget, you have deadlines you have to hit, you're assigning tasks out to people and doing follow-up. It's basically what a manager does. So I always recommend if you're looking to get into management, one of the first things you should tackle is project management skills. Um, the project management PMP is great, but you have to have five years experience to get that. So it's not ideal for everybody. So the CAP M, uh, which is the associate of project manager, or, or, Associate of Project Management, there we go. Uh, the Cap M is easier because it doesn't have that experience requirement. So I encourage you to look into that and get a good handle on how to manage projects. And then ask your current manager if you can lead a project. And, and even if they say no, take something that you're gonna do anyway and turn it into a project. Run through the whole process, kind of get that experience. And that way, when you sit down and say, look, I'm really interested in becoming a manager, you've got a skill that actually applies to it. You can show like, well, you know, I, I manage this budget, this, this process from start to finish. We came in under budget and on schedule. That's a, a positive thing that reflects well upon you. Now, another thing is don't hesitate to ask your manager. Now, not every manager out there is a good manager. I know there's some pretty bad ones that are out there. I've, I've seen them over the years. But you'd be surprised if you go to your manager and say, you know, one day, one day I'd like to be in your position. No, not today. I'm not trying to bump you out of the company, right? But one day I'd like to be in your position. What do I need to do to get there? And most companies will have some kind of management training program because a good manager has a pipeline. And what I mean by a pipeline is, let's say, let's say I get, well, we can be morbid and say I get hit by a bus today, or we can be positive and say, what if I win the lottery today and I'm out the door? See you later, Wes, right? Well, What's going to happen to all the work that was assigned to me, right? I, I am the CTO of ACI Learning, so a lot of things depend upon me. And if I walk out the door, does the company just not have a CTO anymore? Well, no. I've actually been training somebody to step in to take my role. In fact, there's like two or three people deep that would all be ready to, to step in and, and take that role. That's what a good manager does. Every manager should have a next in line. And so if you express an interest in moving into management, they usually have a way, like a training budget or a program, or at least allowing you to sit in on some meetings to start dipping your toes in, and that gives you some exposure to becoming a manager. And maybe you can get promoted within your organization, but a lot of times, the only way to get promoted is if your boss gets fired or retires or they move up, right? And so you're kind of uh, pinning your career to someone else's, which is not ideal. So it may be that you gain the experience but then have to go somewhere else to actually get that promotion. And some people feel really guilty about that. Like, oh, I've got so much loyalty to this company. They helped mm -hmm. train me. And that's true. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you've got your life you have to lead. And if it's going to be 10 years before you can become a manager, but you've got an opportunity to go and do it in two, just be open with the company about mm -hmm. that and say, I'm, I'm really interested in moving up. I've got an opportunity over here. And if they're good managers, they'll understand. That's just, that's how it is. All right, very good. All right, so next, uh, the next one's a common one that we see even in the forums here at IT Pro TV. Are IT certifications enough to apply to jobs without any prior experience in the field? So I'll say yes, uh, but it does depend a bit on the job. Sure. So when you're talking about 
help desk or junior sysadmins, junior database admins, things of that nature, yes, just a certification usually designates that you have the equivalent of a year of field experience or more in some cases. Wes, do you remember, um, like, for Network Plus, how many years it counts for? Uh, I think it's like 12 months. 12 months? Yeah. So one year. Yeah. So uh, I, I, quick quick math there, 12 months. That's right. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. So, <laughs> so this is the value I bring to these uh, webinars. So, um, <laughs> so, so it shows that you have the equivalent knowledge of somebody who's worked in the field for that period of time. That's the purpose of the certification. If you just worked a year as a network admin, well, it's on your resume. You can prove it that way. But if you're just getting started, you don't have it on your resume. So the certification helps you to designate that. Now, some companies will use certifications to validate their employees have actually learned what they should. Hey, you've been working for us for a year. Are you at the level where you're supposed to be? So let's get you to go and and uh, uh, take this test and we'll find mm -hmm. out, right? Not everybody does that, though. It's not, not very common. So it normally is to have something on your resume to show that you've got that knowledge. Uh, but there are some jobs, and I mentioned one earlier, pen testing, mm -hmm. right? If you just have certifications on your resume and you want to be a pen tester, no, no responsible cybersecurity company would hire you and put you into a pen testing role where you would be inserted in a production company attacking their systems. That would be nuts, right? So not every job is going to be open to you when you don't have experience. But you'll find that a lot are. And so you may be able to get in with a different position at that organization, mirror some of the other employees, you know, tag along, just do whatever you can to learn, and then get promoted from within. So that's a great way to do that. All right. I got another question for you. And boy, is the timing impeccable. What is a good IT path for those that aren't good at math? You know, so you'd be surprised at how many things in IT don't require math. Thank God. And, uh, and, and even some of the math you do have to do isn't really math, right? Like uh, subnetting. Subnetting, yep. That one pops out. Do yeah. you consider that math? Oh, in my world it is, absolutely, because one <laughs> and one's hard. But uh, yeah, that's right. That's about the only math that we have to do is calculate. Yeah, like it's, what, yeah. what's 64 plus 32. That's right. And you, know, you start yeah. working that out. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, there's not really a whole lot of math involved. Now, if you want to be a developer, there's some math involved, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but for everybody else, even like a database administrator, where in, in database administration, you're worried about query times and disk I.O., and there's a lot of numbers that you're looking at, but you're not doing math on them. Mm -hmm. You're saying, all right, this hard drive has six gigabit of throughput on mm -hmm. it, and my index searches are generating this much throughput. Let me just compare the numbers. Is one bigger than the other? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that, That's math I can handle, right? Uh, so for most people, there's not a whole lot of math, except if you're going to be doing programming of any sort. There's almost always math involved there. Uh, various operations that you perform, especially if it's functional programming, there's tons of math and functional programming. So you know, that's, that's where that kind of division is. So if you're not good at math, don't sweat it. Sysadmin positions, network admin positions, even cybersecurity to a degree don't really involve math. Now with cybersecurity, when you start getting into trying to reverse engineer applications, when you are examining memory dumps and things like that, yeah, yeah, math starts to creep in. And any kind of automation that they do with uh, scripting to, to scan networks and so on may involve some math there. But for the other jobs, you can pretty much be math free. All right. Very good. Yeah, definitely a good thing for me, for sure. <laughs> so we got another question coming in. It says, I want to get into uh, IT more for the fun of it rather than uh, anything business related. What makes IT fun to you and what's the coolest thing you've ever built? Uh, you know, so fun for me is learning something new. Like I just, I like learning new things. I like working with cutting edge stuff. Uh, there was a time in my career, uh, this was, uh, well, I don't know, I think it was like 2002 probably. So it was, it was a long time ago, uh, where I started getting a bit bored. I, I was doing the same thing over and over again. I, I had become a bit of a, a specialist with Microsoft Exchange. And so I was doing tons of Microsoft Exchange migrations. I was getting bored with it. Well, under the hood, Microsoft Exchange is just a SQL database. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to learn SQL. It's time to learn databases. And so I did. And, and it really kind of rejuvenated my career. It gave me something exciting and new and different to learn. And I spent a few years messing around with databases before moving on to the next thing and saying, all right, you know, now I want to learn XYZ and, and advancing. So for me, what makes IT fun is learning new stuff. And that's why like, when I go home at the end of the night, uh, my hobby is IT. So it's not uncommon, this drives my wife nuts, it's not uncommon for me to go home and 
I'm bringing up containers and seeing how I can automate their deployment, or I'm messing around in AWS and I'm just doing that for fun, right? And those are skills that I bring back into the, the content that I create in, in my workplace. Uh, but that, that's part of what makes it fun for me. Uh, as far as the coolest thing I've built, I've built some really weird stuff over the years. Um, I I have a hard time thinking, what's the coolest thing? I, I don't mean, know, that cluster that you built with Raspies, that small cluster was a really cool <laughs> yeah, project. That was, that was entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to learn Kubernetes, mm -hmm. and you really needed a bunch of different hardware. I didn't want to do it in virtual machines, so that's right. a bit of a mess. Uh, and you can go online and find like Vagrant files or whatever that'll just plop. Now you've got a Kubernetes cluster, but you didn't learn anything. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was that was spread across Raspberry Pis. That was that was entertaining. Um, but I, I would say the coolest thing that I built uh, was IT Pro TV. Mm -hmm. You know, in the in the early days of IT Pro TV, it was just Tim Broom and myself, mm -hmm. and we decided to create this company. And we we brainstormed, we came up with ideas, and then I built the infrastructure. So we you know, we started as a WordPress server that was hosted in the cloud uh, with a payment gateway, and and I, I built all of that. And some of it I knew really well, some of it I had to learn. Uh, but when we started growing, that gave me the chance to add in high availability, auto renewing certificates, uh, just a, a lot of really cool stuff. And and even some of the more managerial skills factor into that because we had to do some PCI compliance in the early days. Uh, now we we offload all that to other people. <laughs> and so, but you know, it was a great learning experience. And so that uh, that took off. It's still around. Yeah, yeah, it is. And you know what? And, and being a helping, you know, or being a part of that uh, process too, Don, it's been great because you would take some of that information, a lot of it that you'd learn, and you would bring it back into us and teach us as well. Yeah. Uh, so another great question. All right. So uh, this is another one about programming. Word uh, is, uh, or has it, uh, that you would uh, have to learn coding to be successful in IT. Is that true? Uh, that is not true, although mm -hmm. I will say that uh, it's getting that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. I, it's not true today, but I do see a future where that is true. And learning to code is a pretty vague term, mm -hmm. right? It, it doesn't mean you need to be a full-on developer, but we're starting to see things like infrastructure as code, right? So in the old days, 10 years ago, <laughs> in the old days, if my boss came to me and said, Don, we need a new database server and uh, you know here's the specs. Well, I would have to go to Dell or HP or whoever and get a quote for a server. I would have to order the server, it would come in and install the operating system, run through the uh, staging testing, get it moved into production, bring it online. It would be a, a month, two month long process to bring this database server up. A lot went into that. Today, we would just go into a cloud service and we would deploy based on our specifications, right? We don't need the hardware anymore. But that infrastructure that goes around with that deployment, the, you know, what virtual networks or VPCs are we setting up? What load balancers are we setting up? What regions do they go in? Uh, you know, how big is the database? How often does it run backups? All of that is eventually going to be defined as infrastructure as code, right? And that's where you write a file, and, and this may be, Terraform or Chef or Puppet or one of the various automation suites that are out there, you write a file that defines everything that you want. That says, I want a database server. Here's how much memory I want it to have. Here's how many disks it needs. Here's the networks it needs to be attached to. And then you just take that file and load it up in the system and it builds what you wanted. Well, a lot of that is code. You, some of it's very simple, uh, YAML, right? Mm -hmm. Yet another markup language, which is human readable. It's not like functions or whatever but you can put functions in there to say, if these conditions are met, then do this action. If these other conditions are met, do this other action. So you can get really advanced with it. And that's where you need to have some programming knowledge. So I would encourage anyone watching this webinar, if you don't have at least some basic rudimentary development skills, you should look into that. That, that is something that you can get by without it today. So today you can get jobs in IT without knowing any coding. But in five years, probably as fast as five years, definitely within 10 years, you're going to need at least something. And honestly, uh, like bash scripting is incredibly useful, easy to learn. Uh, you're really just stringing together commands. It's a great way to wade into development. Uh, PowerShell, same thing. You're, you're getting some development type skills without being a hardcore coder. And you'll find you start learning that stuff just through doing your normal work. All right, very good. So we've got another question here. Uh, Jason's asking, I'm currently looking for an entry-level networking or security job. Uh, what are some keywords to use during my job search? So uh, I find the most useful thing is hardware brands. 
right? So like, let's say you really know Juniper equipment. Well, I don't wanna just find jobs for network admins because I might go to a company that doesn't even have Juniper equipment. But if I start searching based on that company name, you know, based on Juniper, then I'm gonna find companies that are advertising looking for that skill and that's gonna make me more effective. I can come in and say, well, I've got this background with Juniper, these certifications or this experience, and that's going to make me a more ideal candidate. So searching based on the equipment or operating systems, database names, right? You don't wanna just say, I know relational databases, get specific. Am I looking for MySQL, MariaDB, Aurora, you know, whatever it is that you're good with, Postgres? Search for those, and that's going to get you careers that are a little more aligned. Did you have something no, no, on that it. one? Okay. Yeah. So as far as keywords, that's going to be a really helpful thing. The opposite is true, though, too. If you're just trying to maximize the results that you get, you can use some of the more vague terms, but it'll be higher quality if you're looking for actual product names. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us here. Uh, you know, uh, we really enjoyed answering all your questions, and we're going to announce uh, the winner of the swag in a second. But first, I want to make sure you know how to check out IT Pro TV. Use the coupon code WEBINAR30 to get 30% off your personal membership, or you can request a demo of a business plan, and you can get the whole team on board. All right, Don, so what do you say we go ahead? Drum roll here. We're going to announce the winner. We want to congratulate Kylie. Kylie, you are the winner of some IT Pro TV swag, and our marketing team is going to reach out to you. Don't put any information in the chat there. <laughs> we will contact you, and we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today. You will receive a link to the recording of the webinar delivered to your inbox. Remember, the coupon code is WEBINAR30. See you back here for the next IT Pro TV webinar.